It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, noted author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Joseph R. Farrington, delegate to Congress from Hawaii. Mr. Farrington, it's a pleasure to have you with us again on the Chronoscope. Our viewers, of course, know that you've been the delegate from Hawaii for a little more than 10 years now. And since the present administration has promised to make Hawaii the 49th state, well, we are particularly interested in what you have to say tonight, sir. Now, first of all, sir, what is the present status of the statehood legislation for Hawaii? Uh, the bill to admit Hawaii to the uh, union as a state has been passed by the House of Representatives and is now pending in the Senate Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs. Would you say that it's being delayed by the present filibuster over the Tidelands issue? Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. That if it were not for uh, uh, the delay in acting uh, on the Tidelands legislation, the statehood bill more than likely uh, would have been on the floor of the Senate already. Well, uh, Mr. Farrington, uh, where does your major opposition as of today uh, come in Congress to statehood for Hawaii? Well, the, the principal resistance comes from the South and uh, from uh, uh, representatives in Congress from the South that adhere uh, to ideas which have been abandoned by a great many people uh, from the South. Are you gradually winning the South over, do you think? I don't think there's any question about it. Uh, there are only two states in the country that didn't give us, uh, uh, only three states that only give it, didn't give us any votes at all in the House on statehood. One was Virginia and the other was Mississippi. Uh, but we had support and strong support from every, every other state in the South. Is the Southern objection uh, principally racial, sir? I think it probably is, although it, it isn't often expressed uh, as such. They are, they are afraid of, uh, of the possibility of perhaps uh, members of the colored races becoming members of the United States Senate. No, not entirely that. I think uh, uh, their fear arises uh, from some apprehension that uh, they have about our approach to the question uh, of race. Well, now, what is the approach to the question of race in Hawaii? Well, we in Hawaii believe that the principles of democracy should apply. Uh, among uh, all people, that no line should be drawn uh, against them in, in any phase of our life. Well, Mr. Farrington, <coughs> don't you also get a, quite a lot of objection to an argument <coughs> that if Hawaii is granted statehood and Hawaii are being so many thousands of miles away from our continental boundaries, mm -hmm. the first thing you know, we'll have the Philippines and it'll break a precedent so that we'll be taking the whole world in after a while. Do you get That's that right. argument? That is one of the basic objections <coughs> that, ra that uh, is raised. Uh, the proponents at that point of view say that uh, it would set a, uh, a serious and injurious precedent to admit to the Union as a state an area that isn't contiguous to the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. In other words, not joined up with the land mass. My answer to that, I'd like to give it, is that that question was decided back in 1900 when Hawaii was incorporated into the Union and made an integral part thereof, as the lawyers say, and, uh, uh, and made a territory of the United States. One of the objections stated on this program, sir, recently was that you, you can't define the geographic limits of, of, of the state of Hawaii. Well, I don't think that objection is valid. Because there's no area in our country that is, ha, has been more clearly defined or more clearly charted than uh, uh, have been the islands of the Hawaiian group. Do you go all the way out to 2,000 miles, out to Midway, for instance, and down to Palmyra or something of that sort? <coughs> I'll answer that this way. Uh, when the uh, Republic of Hawaii asked for annexation uh, by the United States, it had within its jurisdiction, in addition to the main eight islands of the Hawaiian group, uh, where all of the people are situated, a number of shoals and minor islets 
that run up to Midway, and the uh, Palmyra down to the south. And so they were covered into the uh, transaction. And the title to those islands rests with the United States government today. The only one of the islands whose title is held privately is Palmyra. The rest well, of them belong to Uncle Sam. Still another objection, Mr. Clarington, as you know, is that, for example, the congressman from uh, New York State stated that Hawaii had too small a population for to have two senators. Uh, what is your answer to that? Well, he's arguing against the American system of government. Uh, the great compromise in the Constitutional Convention, you remember, between the large and the small states was to give uh, representation in the House on the basis of population and representation in the Senate to the sovereign states. And when he argues that Hawaii should not receive, uh, uh, have uh, two senators, two members of the United States Senate with only 500,000 population, I I with New York having the same number with a million, uh, 15 million people, he's making an argument against our system of government, and he's arguing against the representation that's now held by, say, 13 other states. Well, the junior senator from Texas on our program, uh, Mr. Price Daniel, the other evening didn't seem to be very enthusiastic about Hawaiian statehood. I thought perhaps one of the reasons might be that he's afraid that uh, Hawaii will become a larger state than Texas. Is there any well, danger of that? Well, I'll see that We'll, we'll cede that uh, uh, distinction to Texas. Well, you, you've taken in a lot of water, but Texas is getting ready to take in a lot of water, too, now. That's maybe. right, and uh, I'd be perfectly willing to cede that water to Texas if Texas will give us their support, too. Uh, more more support. seriously, sir, one of the really serious objections uh, held by many Americans has to do with communism in the islands. Uh, Mr. Harry Bridges, the labor leader who's been accused of being a communist, is a powerful figure in Hawaiian labor. That's correct, isn't it, sir? Yes, and he's also a powerful figure on the Pacific Coast. Is there any danger that, uh, that Mr. Bridges might, in effect, become a political dictator in Hawaii? I don't think there's the remotest possibility that Mr. Bridges will become a political dictator in Hawaii. How many people out there belong to his union now? There are about 25,000 members of his union, and within that membership, there are great many people who resent uh, uh, communist influences and in a number of very important instances are actively combating communist influences within the union. The great rank and file of that organization consists of good American citizens, and I think given the proper time, they will meet that problem as effectively as many other unions have met it. Well, Mr. Farrington, you were saying that it looks like there's going to be a strong chance that uh, Hawaii will be the 49th state soon. Would you predict when, in your opinion? I'd like to tell you what I hope, because I don't like to predict what the United States Senate uh, will do. I hope, and my hope arises from a rather thorough knowledge of the situation, that this issue will come to a vote sometime before the end of May. I think that as soon as the Tidelands issue is finally settled one way or the other, and they dispose of the controls legislation, that the Senate will move as planned to the consideration of Hawaiian statehood. And I can't believe that with the support it now has among the people of the country, uh, with the President of the United States, the leadership of Congress, uh, that uh, they can avoid coming to a decision on it. And, if, and if Hawaii does get statehood, uh, are you going to run for senator? I'm not prepared to say what I will do after, until, uh, after Hawaii becomes a state, well, because the, the achievement of that in itself, to me, is a sufficient goal for the present. Uh, Mr. Farrington, the sugar industry, of course, in Hawaii is one of your most important industries. Now, just what is the, the ec economics of sugar as regards statehood? Uh, as you say, the production of sugar is our basic industry. It brings us an income of 125 to 135 millions of dollars uh, a year. It's vital to our welfare. The production of sugar under the conditions that prevail in Hawaii is dependent upon the protection of tariffs or of a quota system. That's federal legislation. And so it's vitally important uh, to the sugar industry that nothing uh, take place in Congress, that nothing be written into that law of which discriminate, discriminates against 
the production of sugar in Hawaii. And, and your sugar will be in a better economic position if you become a state than you are now as a territory. Oh, we'll be very much more secure than we are because so long as we're a territory, it's within the power of Congress and the right of Congress to well, discriminate now, against now, several, us. Several million of us Americans have visited Hawaii. Can you tell us just briefly uh, what the situation is as regards the tourist industry in Hawaii? Oh, there's been a tremendous development in the tourist industry during the past few years. And uh, many people are anticipating that within a short time, that will become Hawaii's leading industry. Well, as a final question, Mr. Farrington. Uh, most Americans, of course, are now looking toward the Far East where we're trying to settle a very difficult situation. Do you believe that the admission of Hawaii as a state would be a propaganda advantage for us as regards our policies in the Far East? I don't think there's anything that this country can do that will more effectively persuade the people of the Far East uh, to the soundness, to the fairness, and to the advantages of our system of government and of democracy than the admission of Hawaii to the Union as a state. You know, the truth of the matter is that there's as much interest, if not more interest, in the question of Hawaiian statehood among the people of the Far East than there are among the people of the eastern part of this country. And the reason for that is that Within our population are more people of Oriental origin, more people of Japanese origin, of Chinese origin, of Korean origin, of Filipino origin, of Samoan origin, and in the rest of the country combined. And all of the homelands of those people are watching to see well, what happens <coughs> to their sons under the American system of government, well, and they are American. Well, thank you very much for being with us this evening, sir. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Joseph R. Farrington, Delegate to Congress from Hawaii. It was painted by Whistler in 1872 and called Portrait of His Mother. Today, it's recognized, like the carnation, as a symbol of Mother's Day. As an honored gift to mother on Mother's Day, many loving sons and daughters buy Longine watches. Now, for those who have this idea, Longine Whitnor jewelers are making special displays of their loveliest watches. For mother on Mother's Day, for any important gift occasion, the world's most honored gift is Longine, the world's most honored watch. Every Longine watch shares the fame of the honored name Longines. Among the world's finest watches, Longines alone has been honored by 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 gold medals, has been equally honored for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now, whatever your needs in a watch, the name Longines is your assurance of superior performance. Each of these magnificent creations, for mother or for you, is powered by the famed Longines watch movement, built for greater accuracy and longer life through superior workmanship. And remember, throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.